Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session, the first of the new season of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a recent collection edited by Elizabeth Borgwart, Christopher McKnight Nichols, and Andrew Preston entitled Rethinking American Grant Strategy, recently published by Oxford University Press. Joining this afternoon are two of those editors, Christopher Nichols of Oregon State University and Andrew Preston of Cambridge University. And serving as commentators this afternoon are Daniel Bessner of the University of Washington and Julia Irwin of the University of South Florida. I'm Eric Arneson from George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, usually if not always on Mondays and pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center since pandemic restrictions here in the virtual realm. And starting with this afternoon's session, we have a full lineup of seminars still ahead of us this season that will carry us well into December. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And I'd like to thank one of our institutional sponsors, the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous individual donors. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, you should know today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the Q&A section of the webinar, we ask those with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom. Those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address will be posted in the chat function. Finally, let me note that today's seminar functions as our annual William Roger Lewis Lecture. Professor Roger Lewis was both a founder of this seminar and a founder of the AHA's National History Center. His scholarly accomplishments and honors are simply too numerous to list fully. Let me just say that he's a former president of the American Historical Association and editor-in-chief of the Oxford History of the British Empire. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin, where he held the Kerr Professorship of English History and Culture and was Distinguished Teaching Professor as well as Director of British Studies a prolific scholar of the British Empire and the Commonwealth and comparative history more broadly, he has influenced generations of students and scholars. And with that, I turn over the screen to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, the Zoom room is all yours. Thanks, Eric. Uh, delighted to welcome all of you as well uh, on behalf of the Wilson Center to this Washington History Seminar and very much looking forward to discussing today's, uh, to, to discussing this volume we're gonna talk about today, Rethinking American Grant Strategy. We'll first turn to the two editors of this volume. Let me just briefly introduce them. Andrew Preston is professor of American history and a fellow of Clare College at Cambridge University and the 2021 president of the Society of Historians, for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer. He's the author or editor of nine books and is currently writing a book on the idea of national security in American history, as well as, as, well as editing volume two of the Cambridge history of the Vietnam War. Christopher McKnight Nichols is director of the Center for the Humanities and the Sandy and Elva Sanders eminent professor in the Honors College at Oregon State University, where he's an associate professor of history. An Andrew Carnegie fellow, Nichols is best known for authoring Promise and Peril, America at the Dawn of a Global Age, published by Harvard in 2011. And he's editor and author of five other books, including the recently published Rethinking American Grand Strategy. Delighted to turn the Zoom room over to the two of you. Let me, before I do that, remind our audience so they can prepare for this. There are three ways that you can uh, uh, participate in the discussion later on. At about five or so, uh, we hope to turn to audience questions and comments. You can, as our preferred way, uh, use the raise hand function and uh, you will be put into a queue and we will call on you. Um, you will have to unmute yourself when prompted to be able to uh, talk to all of us. Secondly, you can use the Q&A function uh, and post your comments or questions at the top of the screen. Uh, 
uh, and we will um, post these to the um, panelists um, as time permits. If you are following us on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to email Rachel Wheatley with any questions or comments and uh, she'll pass those on to us. You can get in line and queue now. And with that, I'll turn it over to, I think Andrew is going first, right? Andrew, great to have you here. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for uh, uh, inviting us to speak about the book. Um, thanks for that kind introduction. Thanks for mentioning the Cambridge history of the Vietnam War. Um, as editor, I'm looking forward to reading your chapter um, when it comes in. So thanks for flagging that up. And uh, sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, so good afternoon uh, to everyone. Good evening, and as, as is my case. Um, if you can barely see out my window, I'm based in the UK. And so it's already nighttime here, um, but this is a great way to sort of cap off uh, the day. Um, and it's a real honor to be speaking at an event named uh, for William Roger Lewis. Um, he's a, a magnificent historian for people in all sorts of uh, fields. And so that was kind of icing on the cake, not only speaking um, to this audience, but um, with this imprimatur um, uh, as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is give an overview of the book and be as brief as possible because it's a big book. It's an edited book, so there are many cooks in the kitchen. Um, but I do want to give a sense of what the book is about uh, before turning over to Chris to sort of dive in more into some of the specifics uh, of the book. And as I said, I will try and be um, as brief as possible. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is take or explain the title, um, which I think gets to the, the core of what the book's purpose is. Um, uh, but work backwards uh, uh, from the title. Um, as Christian showed, and as he said, when he held up the copy of the book, the book is called Rethinking American Grand Strategy. And I'd like to take those three parts, the rethinking, the American, and the grand strategy, but take them in, rever in reverse order, um, in, because that's sort of the uh, order of ascending importance um, backwards, but it, that's, that's just how it is. And so I'd like, I'd like to start with explaining why grand strategy. Why did we decide to focus on grand strategy? And uh, the simple reason is that um, the term is everywhere. The term has been everywhere for 10, 15, 20 years uh, or more. Um, it's become extremely fashionable to study grand strategy, not just in the academy, um, but I would say even more so in uh, foreign policy circles, in defense circles, um, and also in business management um, and in other sort of uh, management uh, studies, but it's also entered the mainstream culture uh, to a certain extent. So it's bandied about a lot, but it's not always understood. At least we felt that it wasn't always understood, at least not in all its uh, complexity. It's clearly important, grand strategy that is, is clearly important to the study uh, of world affairs and to an appreciation of how and why power is projected and why it's projected globally and what the effects uh, of American power uh, are around the world. And we wanted to understand grand strategy better, where it came from, what it means today, how it's changed over time, and how it can enhance our understanding of the world around us. In other words, we thought that we had a contribution to make to the booming industry of grand strategy studies. So that takes care of grand strategy, I hope. But why American? Why focus on the United States? And the glib answer is, it's also a truthful answer, though, um, is that happens to be the country that Liz, Chris, and I um, all study. That's the country that we know best. Uh, we're not experts on Russia or China or Britain or Brazil, and you could do um, an edited book on the grand strategy of all of those countries, but we focus on the United States. We're all Americanists, um, uh, at least among the editors, and so that's why we focused on the United States. But there are actually intellectually intellectual reasons for justifying uh, this project uh, as well. You can have uh, a study of the grand strategy of all sorts of different countries, but I would argue, and not just because I'm an Americanist, but I would argue that the United States is the best uh, case study, the best laboratory for examining uh, grand strategy. And it's because the United States, not uniquely, but I would say on the scale that it does, it is unique in this sense, um, is, uh, has amassed all sorts of different kinds uh, of power. The historical sociologist, Michael Mann, talked about um, the various sources of social power, and he identified them as ideological, economic, military, and political. And to that list, to that list of four, I would add uh, culture, which man kind of ignores, including not only art and music and so on, but also um, religion. 
And not many countries tick all of those boxes that have um, vast reserves of, of all types of social power, ideological, economic, military, political, um, and cultural. Not only does the United States um, tick all of those boxes, it would tick all of those boxes at or um, near the very top of the list, if we can even quantify some things like, like cultural power um, or, uh, or ideological power. But certainly on anyone's list, whether you love or hate the United States, the United States would feature highly um, in ticking uh, all of those boxes. Um, and I would say that it ticks those boxes uh, in most categories by, uh, by is, is the, is, has the top spot um, by some distance. And so if you want a topic or a case study or a laboratory for the study of grand strategy, especially a study like ours that is pushing people, as I'm going to say in a second, to take a broader, more capacious view of grand strategy, to rethink grand strategy in a much more elastic way, then the United States is an absolutely uh, ideal uh, laboratory uh, for that. <clears throat> and so that brings me to my final point, why rethinking? Um, and this, I, uh, I think Chris would agree, is the most important part of the title. So Chris, Liz, and I, the three co-editors, are all fairly well-versed in traditional military and diplomatic history, and in ways that push at the boundaries of traditional uh, diplomatic uh, and military history. Um, and we wanted to explore grand strategy in more complex ways, in ways that our work often, uh, in, in, um, in ways that uh, our work often heads, the direction in which our work often heads. Uh, this also reflected trends in uh, the wider disciplines of diplomatic and military history, trends in Schaefer with the cultural turn and the transnational turn, um, but also in the Society for Military History um, with the, the, the growth of the, the so-called new military history, which of course isn't so new uh, anymore, but the study of war and society, not just operational uh, history. And not coincidentally, I think both of those developments, the cultural turn in diplomatic history and the war and society turn in military history have had Americanists at the forefront. I'm not saying Americanists have invented those innovations, but they've been um, uh, at the forefront. Strategy was originally defined by military affairs. Um, uh, first history, then strategy and tactics going, uh, went back to the ancients um, and grand strategy grew in the 20th century out of that uh, tradition um, of looking at strategy in almost purely uh, military terms. And some historians today, military historians, still argue that to study strategy, and especially grand strategy, you have to take an exclusively military focus and to move grand strategy beyond the military, GS kind of loses its, its analytical uh, coherence. But we thought, Liz, Chris, and I thought that there must be more to grand strategy um, than this. Um, uh, not just to strategy, but more obviously to grand strategy, which is by its very nature inherently more capacious um, than strategy. Grand strategy studies for most of the 20th century focused inordinately on matters of war and diplomacy, but things began to change. Some folks were already thinking about grand strategy more broadly, more holistically, more capaciously, most notably at Yale's grand strategy program, which has been going now for just over uh, 20 years. And we wanted to push this thinking even further. Um, and we wanted to collect a lot of this thinking, this rethinking of grand strategy um, in one place. I should stress that our point wasn't to reinvent grand strategy, um, but to rethink it. This means not replacing traditional grand strategy with something new, but integrating the two together, taking the sort of more traditional or conventional uh, military approach um, and weaving it or blending it with uh, newer approaches that focus on culture, that focus on ideology, that focus on race, gender, religion, um, and other categories uh, of analysis. As we write in the introduction, Quote, inescapably, strategy is and always has been an act of statecraft, but it isn't only that. Um, and as we also add elsewhere uh, in the introduction, uh, even when it is about statecraft, it isn't always about diplomatic negotiation or the deployment of troops. Grand strategy or a reconsideration of grand strategy must also include things like public health, human migration, um, integrating hard power uh, with soft power. And Chris will talk uh, about uh, more about the specifics that we pursue um, in the book. So we've got chapters on what would have been considered a part of grand strategy if this book had been published 50 years ago, or maybe even 100 years ago. Um, but we've also got what I would say are some fairly cutting edge examinations of 20, uh, 21st century uh, perspectives. Okay, having broken down the title, I now want to lay out some of the key concepts before handing over uh, to Chris in the minute 
or a minute and a half or so that I have left. What is grand strategy, at least according to us? So there are um, a million different definitions of grand strategy, and people argue over this vociferously. So it's an impossible term uh, to define. But it is incumbent upon us as editors, if we're going to publish a book called Rethinking American Grand Strategy, to at least let readers know what we're talking about when we talk about grand strategy. And the definition that we have in our introduction, although we didn't mean it to be a kind of according to Hoyle definition, this is what grand strategy is. And we, you can't deviate from it. One of the one of the best features of the book, if I can say so, is that people, uh, different contributors, take the idea of grand strategy and, and approach it and treat it uh, in very different ways. But the definition that we came up with in the intro is, quote, a grand strategy is a holistic and interconnected system of power encompassing all aspects of society in pursuit of international goals based on the calculated relationship of means to ends. For it to be a strategy, limited means have to be calibrated to the attainment of certain ends, but those ends can be immediate in both space and time. That's one of the limitations of strategy. For it to be a grand strategy, space and time are stretched out. It's not just about attaining the immediate end in front of you, but other ends further down the line to attain a much broader and longer lasting goal that includes not just winning a battle, but um, shaping a, what, a much wider uh, atmosphere. In military terms, it's not just about winning the war, but also shaping a durable peace afterwards. And to do that, you need to consider all sorts of things that go well beyond uh, what one would normally find uh, on the battlefield. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to my co-editor, Chris Nichols. Thanks very much, Andrew. That was great. Um, thanks to Christian and to Eric uh, and the great staff who's uh, kindly set us up for this. Um, and it's a real honor, again, to be giving the Roger Lewis lecture and this, have this roundtable on this really timely and relevant topic. Uh, if you're thinking about the Biden administration, if you're thinking about the transformation of the U.S.'s role in the world in 2021, um, I would argue that rethinking the history of American grand strategy is absolutely essential for us um, as citizens, as engaged members of communities um, in thinking about the world and the re nation's relationship to it. Um, so uh, my task uh, is to give a little bit more depth to what Andrew just sketched out in terms of the volume. Um, and uh, usually when we're, we're chatting about this sort of thing, um, I like to go a little bit further from uh, and deeper into the definition um, that Andrew was spelling out. And so one of the things that animated us in doing this book and putting together a conference that gave rise to it and inviting a, a number of fantastic scholars, some of whom had never really worked on grand strategy before to help uh, shed new light on the subject, um, was a fairly basic observation that is somewhat absent uh, in the existing literature, uh, which is something like this, that a theory uh, that bears little resemblance to the reality of the world around us, uh, in which gender, race, the environment, public health, and a variety of cultural, social, political, and economic issues are not only salient, but urgently pressing, can only be so useful. And that's essentially the motivation and definitional structure for how we rethink grand strategy in the book. That is, you can't stick to statecraft and not look at these other kinds of questions. If you're thinking about uh, the cultural cultural factors that Andrew was describing um, that give rise to the worldviews of policymakers, uh, but also leaders of international non-governmental organizations, um, individuals and social within social movements, grassroots orientations to the world, and aims at reshaping society, you have to look at some of those other factors, right? And so that's really a core element of how we approach the 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 project. Now, another piece of thinking about grand strategy that I want to flag right up front in this conversation um, is it, thinking about the term itself. So Andrew um, did a great job spelling out definitional challenges and how we approach that. Um, but another way to think about it is to historicize the term. This is something we do a little in the introduction, and you see this throughout the chapters of the book. But particularly the focus on the mid-20th century is important here. And I imagine this is something that our panelists will be talking about too. Um, so if you're looking, if you're doing keyword searches, if you're looking at etymology of the term, grand strategy really 
arises in the mid 20th century, comes out of the Great War experience, and you see a proliferation of use of the term in the 1930s into the 1940s. Um, you see this particularly from Anglo-American thinkers um, and at the intersection of the academy um, and those involved in diplomacy. And this is a really important way for us to move forward in historicizing and thinking through then the consequences of that. And you know what you might argue, what you find in a lot of the literature is that the Cold War sort of um, superimposed uh, itself uh, onto pre-existing sets of U.S. grand strategic objectives. <clears throat> in the book, which where we go from roughly the colonial era up through the present, you can see the development of these kinds of grand strategic objectives at the nation state level. Um, and, uh, things like, you know, trying to have uh, geopolitical and economic dominance first in the Western Hemisphere. So here you could think of markers like the Monroe Doctrine. You could think of um, peoples and groups moving around the hemisphere, not just at the level of uh, state actors. Um, and then by the time you get to the mid 20th century, and we can spell out more of this history. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more of that in my brief remarks. By the time you get to the rise of the Cold War, the Truman administration, um, you, you see an attempt to establish US, U.S. geopolitical and economic dominance in Western Europe in Asia, uh, and not just in the hemisphere anymore. And that set of changes, um, not coincidentally, um, is the era of the archetypal grand strategy, is the era of containment uh, and George Kennan. And we've got a great chapter in the volume by David Greenberg, rethinking and recasting Kennan in terms of some of his assumptions, in terms of his racism and his misogyny, for instance. Um, but it's also uh, but it, so it's it's very important to unpack the mindset and worldview of, of the people who are developing these strategies. So that's that's one piece of the puzzle here. All right. So um, in diving into some of the contributions of the book and the flow of it, you know, one of the things we tried to do uh, was to um, push in different directions to do the kind of ca capacious rethinking work uh, that Andrew um, described. So one thing I like to flag when we talk about this subject, you've already heard it a few times, is that we we had um, Betsy Bradley and Lauren Taylor write one of the chapters. Betsy Bradley was at the time um, the director of the Grand Strategy Program at Yale. She's now the president of Vassar and is a great public health scholar. This was about 2015 or 2016. And what she encouraged us to think about when we think about frameworks for grand strategy in understanding other areas or a grand strategic lens uh, through which to understand different thematic foci in history uh, was to look deeply at public health. Now, that may seem obvious to us living through a pandemic, but in 2015 or 2016, thinking about the, the uh, grand strategic dimensions of U.S. Uh, global public health questions was very new. You don't find many uh, essays like this. Her example in the volume, which I think is really great for showing the strengths and limitations of a grand strategic kind of uh, global public health is PEPFAR, uh, the uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief in the George Bush administration. Um, uh, the emergency plan was a five-year bilateral commitment by the U.S. That's important. Um, it, it leads to developing a, a global, um, uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle there uh, is developing an office of the global AIDS coordinator uh, to manage and coordinate U.S. Uh, government supported HIV AIDS relief. Um, it's credited with saving something on the order of 17 to 20 million lives in Africa. Um, and it was, was arguably uh, the, the main success of the Bush administration, of course, in that era, was something that came out of George Bush's thinking and was developed through a, a rigorous uh, policy um, processes. So it has lots of, and, and, and to add one more element, back to the definitions, right, it's about using le necessarily limited means to, attend, to attain uh, large aspirational ends, that is, you know, uh, ending and relieving um, the AIDS devastation uh, in Africa in particular, and then aiming to do something even more world shaping, which would be to push back on and, and hopefully eradicate AIDS itself. That's an enormous kind of set of goals. Uh, the problem here was that uh, PEPFAR was also uh, bilaterally or unilaterally imposed. And so you have to read the chapter to learn more, but but the challenge is there that, that, that in fact, you know, this is a, a real problem for American foreign policy and global public health questions because the U.S. has had has prioritized the so-called doctrine of the free hand in lots of these efforts. And Julia Irwin, who will be talking shortly, talks about this in terms of humanitarian relief, um, and I'm sure she could address that in her chapter in this book. Um, so that's that's one piece of the puzzle. But so uh, I wanted to emphasize, you know, global public health as grand strategy. Another area that that um, that. Uh, Andrew touched on and Andrew's own work has has uh, illuminated is religion 
Um, for me, one of the reasons that I got invested in thinking about grand strategy was I was perplexed that some areas that have so much importance uh, in terms of human meaning and in terms of ideology were often absent in some of the literature on the subject. And religion seemed to me to be the best, single best example in human history. Uh, so many core motivations uh, can, be, uh, can be understood to be coming out of religious orientations. Um, and in particular in the U.S. context, the mission movement um, of the 19th century into the 20th century very clearly fits most definitional structures for grand strategy. Uh, necessarily limited means matched to long-term aspirational ends. Uh, my, my favorite line and way to think about this is the evangelist D.L. Moody aspired in the early 20th century to evangelize the world in one generation. I can't imagine anything that's more grand strategic in its aims than that. And so one, uh, Emily Conrad Crutz has a chapter in our volume about mission movements as uh, doing grand strategy, mission strategy as grand strategy, and some of the strengths and limitations of thinking that way. But she says, if you apply virtually any of the definitional structures, mission movements clearly fit this. Uh, and they left the kinds of robust records uh, because of how they were structured that are, are quite similar to the State Department uh, or, or formal foreign policy apparatus. And so you know, if you if you expand your definition of grand strategy to look at religion and you expand the kinds of groups that you call uh, those capable of doing grand strategy, uh, and we're not really invested in policing the boundary of who and what counts as a grand strategist exactly, except to say, look, here, here are some examples where that fits, um, you know, then I would argue that religion is very much there and same with mission movements, that they need to fit. And uh, if you want to add to that and think a bit more about that in terms of the specific content, so many of the children of missionaries acquire the language skills and the cultural competency in the 19th century and early 20th century to become then the next generation of diplomats by that period of the 1930s and 1940s when the US is explicitly grappling with developing a grand strategy. So if you play this out generationally over time, looking for different kinds of grand strategies and strategists, you find real confluences in the historical record and in the archives. And that's something that a lot of the authors in this volume um, suggest to be the case uh, and, and is, and is um, a really important set of questions for us to pursue. Uh, I want to add a, a couple more pieces as I, as I try to wrap up. We also talk in the volume, and we have another chapter by another uh, the current head of the Yale Grand Strategy Program, um, Beverly Gage, uh, which is about uh, the, the blob and the mob, as she calls it. Um, and one of the things that she notes in that chapter, second chapter of the book, um, is that uh, social movement leaders like Saul Alinsky, for instance, explicitly develop their social movement ideologies around kind of grand strategic thinking. The very first sentence of the first chapter of Alinsky's um, uh, key contribution uh, Rules for Radicals, which was written in 1971. The very first sentence of it draws on a, the, uh, some of the icons of grand strategy programs on Machiavelli, in fact, and says, the prince was written by Machiavelli for the haves on how to hold power. Uh, the Rules for Radicals uh, is written for the have-nots on how to take it away. It is very clearly about grand strategy, a social movement with grand strategic aims, um, a matching of limited means to long-term ends. And here's, that's just one of the many kinds of examples that we have in here. And finally, as we sort of zoom out a little bit more on contributions, another element at play here that I think is very important is the role of race. We all know that, experiencing that in, in the last few years. Um, but one of the things that the, many of the chapters in this book uh, excavate are the way the subtle influences of a global color line of the ways in which uh, the cultural embeddedness of, of different assumptions about race and racism and racial hierarchies are very much there in developing grand strategies who and what counts as a grand strategist um, is also racially inflected and we've got a terrific chapter by Adrian Lynn Smith on the unbearable whiteness of grand strategy uh, and you can see this in several dimensions one about who and what counts as grand strategy, and another element as sort of how is white supremacy called out in thinking about these structures of foreign policy and foreign relations. Um, and so I, I thought, though, that I would end with kind of a, a, a quote and a question for us uh, for our discussion. So taking that, um, priv that pr uh, privilege here as an editor. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, the advantages of democracies versus other systems of government and doing grand strategy and the kinds of groups and people who um, organize grand strategies outside the level of states, um, but within state structures. So Fisher Ames, who is one of the lesser remembered American founders, 
um, argue that a monarchy is a merchantman that sails well, but will sometimes strike on a rock and go to the bottom. A republic is a raft, which will never sink, but then your feet are always in the water. And I wonder if in some ways, uh, some of the things we've seen in recent years, we see with the Obama administration, then the Trump administration, and now Biden, is the unwieldiness of the raft of democracy in developing effective grand strategies, uh, but perhaps that it is a, a fairly good system for uh, the long, kind of long-term uh, multi-generational approaches uh, to grand strategy at the state, at the state level, like containment. Um, so I'm curious to know what, what we all think about this question about the democracy versus other systems in developing grand strategies and also uh, for social movements, for mission movements and others, what kinds of systems um, are available, what kinds of ideologies are available in, in democracies and other kinds of systems. Um, so I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Andrew. Um, great introductions to the volume. Uh, we now have the privilege to have uh, two wonderful scholars um, with us to provide initial comments on the book and open up the discussion that I hope will involve many of our sizable audience um, uh, uh, later, um, a bit later in this session. We'll start with Julia Irwin who is Associate Professor and Associate Chair of History at the University of South Florida. She earned her PhD in history with a concentration in the history of medicine and science from Yale University. Her research focuses on the place of humanitarian assistance in 20th century US foreign relations and international history. Her first book, Making the World Safe, the American Red Cross and the Nation's, Human and the Nation's Humanitarian Awakening, published by Oxford in 2000. 13 is a history of US international relief efforts during World War I. She is now completing a second book, Catastrophic Diplomacy, US Foreign Disaster Assistance uh, in the American Century. Uh, she is also the author of a number of articles and book chapters, too many to mention here, including most recently though, I'd like to mention her diplomatic history article on our climactic moment, hazarding a History of the United States and the World. And of course, she is the author of uh, the article, uh, Disastrous Grand Strategy, U U.S. Humanitarian Assistance and Global Natural Catastrophe uh, in the Rethinking American Grand Strategy volume. She'll be followed by Daniel Bassner, who is the Joff Hanauer Ponners Associate Professor of Western Civilization in the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. He is the author of Democracy in Exile, Hans Speyer and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual, published by Cornell in 2018, which we had the pleasure of launching as part of the Washington History Seminar back then when we were still meeting in person. Uh, he's also the co-editor of, of The Decision Imagination, Sovereignty, Social Science and Democracy in the 20th Century, published by Berkan in 2019. He's a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a contributing editor at Jacobin Magazine, and a co-host of the podcast, American Prestige. It's great to have both of you here, Julia and Dan. Julia, I think you'll start us off, right? Great. great. Thanks very much, Christian, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to join everyone, uh, to join the panel and to comment on this terrific edited volume, which I'm very pleased to be a part of. I'm the insider here, I think, and, and Danny will be commenting as the outsider. So um, I'm gonna begin my remarks though with a confession because who doesn't like a confession? Uh, several years ago, when Chris Nichols and Andrew Preston and their co-editor, Elizabeth Borgward, asked me to participate in the conference that would eventually lead to this volume, I immediately and enthusiastically said yes, even as I secretly thought to myself, what the heck do I know about grand strategy? Uh, my research focuses on a subject that um, hasn't really traditionally been associated with grand strategy, the histories of US foreign assistance and international humanitarian aid. More precisely, my work focuses on emergency relief for the victims of war and disaster during the 20th century. Now, this isn't to say that I hadn't thought of foreign aid in strategic terms. In the books and articles I've written, I've long maintained that foreign aid is inherently, and in fact, deeply political. When US policymakers contribute humanitarian assistance to other nations, I argue, they do so not only to relieve the suffering of others, but to promote the United States 
diplomatic, economic, and strategic interests abroad. And yet, even though I had no problem conceiving of foreign aid in such patently strategic terms, I hadn't really thought all that hard about its relation to American grand strategy, at least not until Chris and Andrew spurred me to do so. Um, as it turned out, though, I was the, hardly the only one who felt like an imposter. When we convened in Oregon for the workshop that launched this project, I learned that many of the other contributors shared the same doubts and questions as I did. What do I know about grand strategy? Why was I invited to contribute? What the heck am I doing here in Oregon? We were historians of religion, of public health, of immigration, of human rights, many of us thought. We weren't scholars of grand strategy. But in the end, that was precisely the point. Chris and Andrew and Elizabeth brought us all together because they wanted to theorize collectively a broader and more capacious understanding of the subject, an even grander grand strategy, if you will. The intent of that conference and of the resulting edited volume that we're discussing right now was never to dismiss or ignore the more traditional concerns of grand strategy, military actions, warfare, high politics. Uh, and indeed, this book is really brimming with those more traditional conventional topics as well. Rather, the goal is to remain attuned to these subjects while also incorporating novel ideas, actors, and frameworks into grand strategic thinking. The objective was to develop a more inclusive, comprehensive, and encompassing vision of grand strategy and what it could be. But you may be asking yourselves why. Uh, why, other than to, to create another book for the world, um, why should we do this? What's to be gained uh, from such a big tent approach to grand strategy? As I think this volume insists, uh, it's because the world is complex and complicated in ways that grand strategic thinking hasn't always knowledge, acknowledged or dealt with sufficiently. Um, as, as Chris and Andrew explain in their introduction, and here I quote, we need to consider phenomena such as race, religion, health, and culture that are essential to comprehending the world, but which have nonetheless been neglected from traditional grand strategic analysis. Uh, Chris already mentioned this quotation in his own comments, um, but, but I had it already and I think it's worth reiterating and I carry quote again, a theory that bears little resemblance to the reality around us every day in which gender, race, the environment, public health, and a wide range of cultural, social, political, and economic issues are not only salient, but urgently pressing, can only be so useful. In other words, whether we are scholars or policymakers, um, how are we to make sense of war, of diplomacy, of statecraft, without approaching the world in all of its messiness and complexity? And the short answer, of course, is that we can't. Uh, and this is where this volume comes in. Uh, Rethinking American Grand Strategy offers a rich conceptual roadmap for thinking about grand strategy from new angles and vantage points uh, in ways that are simultaneously more nuanced and more far-reaching. In a relatively brief set of comments, it's impossible to discuss all these new approaches in full. Uh, so instead, I'd like to highlight three illustrative examples, uh, some of which echo Chris, uh, things that Chris already brought up, um, but drawn from the book's chapters, uh, which demonstrate this volume's range and scope. To paraphrase Sesame Street, uh, the examples I'm highlighting today are brought to you by the letter R, religion, race, and reproductive politics. Let's start with the first, religion. Uh, in her essay, which Chris already brought up and alluded to, Emily Conroy Crutz focuses on American Protestant missionaries in the 19th century. These men and women, as she's persuasively shows, were not only behaving as religious actors, they both acted and thought strategically. In Emily's words, they, quote, had a grand plan for the role of the United States in the world. And they understood missionary work and evangelizing as a means to achieve those ends. So too did US policymakers who supported these individuals and their overseas missions. Missionary strategy, she concludes, was American grand strategy for it helped to shape a clear and overarching vision of, the Amer of America's role on the world stage. Turning to race and racism, Adrian Lynn Smith's essay opens with a bold pronouncement. The problem for grand strategy, she writes, paraphrasing W.B. Du Bois, is the problem of the color line. Developing her critiques further, Lynn Smith admonishes scholars of grand strategy for failing to properly consider, and sometimes to consider at all, race and other forms of social difference and their constitutive relationship to power. This is a grave mistake, she continues. For to ignore race is to misapprehend how power works in the United States 
and how racialized power in turn has shaped American foreign relations. As Lynn Smith concludes, we must accept that ideologies does not exist separately from scholarship. It is what legitimizes the practice of power. Finally, turning to my third R, reproductive politics, Laura Briggs critiques scholars of grand strategy for assuming that issues related to gender, sexuality, and reproduction, quote, belong to a feminized private world of children and families, rather than to the robust masculine world of politics, militaries, and foreign policy. As Briggs argues, this imagined distinction between masculine and feminine concerns and between the public and the private spheres ignores how politics actually operates. As she demonstrates in her essay, policymakers from Henry Kissinger to Ronald Reagan to Bill Clinton have used birth control, abortion, transnational adoption, and other related policies to advance a wide range of US strategic goals, among them containment, development, free trade, and anti-communism. The personal, in short, was always and is always political. Religion, race, reproductive politics, uh, these are just a small sample of the perspectives that the several dozen contributors to Rethinking Grand Strategy explore. Uh, as even this partial sampling suggests, the volume really offers a diverse and wide ranging approach to the concept of grand strategy. Uh, Chris, Andrew, and the co-editor, Elizabeth, uh, should be commended for conceiving of this book, for bringing it to fruition, but above all for challenging us, whether we're scholars, uh, scholars uh, policymakers, or practitioners, uh, to think more capaciously about grand strategy and how we might define it. Uh, to conclude my remarks, I'd like to pose a couple of questions as we're transitioning from comments to questions uh, for the editors uh, intended to fuel our conversation. Um, here, I'd like to turn away from the 19th and 20th centuries, the history that is covered in this book, and towards the 21st. With both of these questions, uh, my goal is to get us thinking about how the history of American grand strategy, especially as, as the two of you define it, can help us make sense of the contemporary United States and its place in the world. Okay, first, uh, this book was published in early 2021 which means the two of you as editors were putting, putting the finishing touches on it before it went into production in 2020, in the first few months of the COVID pandemic. Um, obviously the bulk of this book was conceived and completed in the, the before times, uh, but I did notice one reference to COVID on page nine. Uh, you briefly mentioned the pandemic while writing, quote, recent events underscore that strategic thinking in realms other than military security, such as public health, uh, might be even more important in the long run. Looking back over the past 12 to 18 months uh, since you first wrote that line, how would you say that the COVID-19 pandemic has a for informed or, or changed maybe your thinking about grand strategy? Uh, in what ways has affirmed what you've written here and what, what we've written here? Um, has anything changed your thinking? Um, and finally, what has it taught us about global health, infectious disease and their relationship to Amer American grand strategy? Uh, second, um, a constellation of related questions. In your introductory essay, you offer brief analyses of the grand strategies of the 43rd and 44th presidents, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. But what about 45 and 46? Did Donald Trump and his administration have a grand strategy in their approach to world affairs? While acknowledging that it's still pretty early in the Biden presidency, uh, do you see any outlines of a visible or coherent grand strategy emerging from his administration? Uh, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, how might the revisionist approach to grand strategy that you advance in this book help us to make sense of Trump's and Biden's respective approaches to world affairs? Those are my comments and my questions. Right. And I just want to thank you for your remarks in advance for the conversation. Uh, and thank you for bringing this book together. I'll look forward to Danny's comments and then to your thoughts on these questions. And conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Terrific. Um, Daniel, would, uh, should we give uh, Chris and Andrew a chance to respond or do you want to sort of go right at it? What's your preference? Um, probably just go right at it and then they can okay, respond. Go. So, so it. Okay, okay, I hope that's okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, as, as I start, I just want to say it's a really great volume um, and it's particularly good for teaching purposes. And I could already see going through it how this is going to really, I think, transform um, U.S. foreign relations courses. I think it provides a very useful way for incorporating intellectual historical approaches to the history of U.S. foreign policy. And I, and I want to commend the volume for that reason. 
Um, so I think it's a great volume. Uh, of course, I'm going to you know give some comments and offer some questions. But before I do that, I just wanted to underline, I think it's a really excellent, uh, well put together volume and highlights the importance in particular of edited volumes and gathering a, a capacious group of scholars to focus on a particular problem. I know in the academy, oftentimes edited volumes don't quote unquote count as much as journal articles, but the, uh, this volume, and I know Chris's forthcoming volume with David Milne, I think really um, give the lie to that claim. So uh, let's go through now the actual volume. So I applaud the effort to incorporate broader voices and adopt a more capacious understanding of, of what grand strategy is in the American case. But I was um, surprised to see throughout the introduction that the uh, editors didn't really make a causal case for what mattered most. Uh, th there's, of course, a difference between the empirical reality of what caused what when and our normative desires. So, for example, the authors say on page six, uh, they're interested in, quote, how states cause their own security is often down to the actions of non-state actors who produce their own theories of power and security. Uh, and this is a note that reoccurs. Here's another quote. Uh, Either in practice or in analysis, grand strategy need not be limited to formal statecraft. And by, by expanding our frame of reference beyond the state and interstate relations, we aim to arrive at a fuller, richer understanding of the sources and mechanisms of human relations in a global age, unquote. So I, I'm curious about the author. I mean, I think it's a pretty big claim to, to argue that non-state actors have as much as a causal force on the security and foreign affairs of a state as state actors. Uh, and this is a, a note that is, I think, hit through at the introduction. So I think it's really important to incorporate these other voices while at the same time distinguishing their causal force on the world. Um, so for example, when you say uh, there are human relations in a global age, to me that begs the question, how truly global is the age? The last 30 years, we've been claiming that we live in a globalized world, and this has been claimed since the 1970s. But I think that the um, articulations that we see both in the re-rise of nationalisms um, within, you know, on the far right and throughout Europe, uh, throughout the North Atlantic world, and, and also criticisms from the left of the political spectrum, I think it's better than just asserting that the age is global and asking who is the age global for and, and where is it global and in what ways is it global? Because I think many people still live profoundly local and national lives. And we as a profession, as we, you know, sort of come out of the age of globalization and, you know, the halcyon days of globalization need to be adopting a more critical perspective of globality and what that actually means. Um, also, uh, throughout the, the book, and I, as an intellectual historian who focuses on ideas like this, the editors emphasize the importance of strategic culture as not only a, but I would say the enabling condition of grand strategy. But I would say uh, equally, if not uh, might even more important is the actual material order created by the hegemon. And this is the classic chicken or egg question. To what degree is grand strategy post hoc justifications for material, uh, more material causal forces in history? Or to what degree is grand strategy actually shaping actors and how they respond to, you know, quote unquote, objective conditions? Um, and I think uh, in, in actual history, it's both. And I'd be curious, you know, to see what the authors say in terms of a theory of history, which they think is more important when. Um, so that is to say, uh, I think that there is um, a benefit and a drawback to what uh, it's a bit of a kitchen sink approach. The benefit is you're expanding our perspective of what grand strategy is, but in incorporating all of these different perspectives, I as a reader was left questioning, which is again more causally important. Um, and I think the, the, the editors limit themselves that uh, you guys specifically say where you're limiting yourselves to quote, asking questions and offering new possibilities. But I think, you know, constructing some form of causal hierarchy is important to the historian's craft. Uh, it's not the only element of the historian's craft, but it's one that I think in particular in diplomatic history, we've gone too far away from in the last generation of scholarship. So I'd like to hear your comments on that. Um, and I think that um, related to that, uh, particularly, it leads me to the question of actors um, I, informed by the social and his cultural his, uh, turns. Um, the editors of the volume say that they focus on uh, voices from below while putting them in dialogue with grand strategies, quote, usual top down focus on strategic leaders and thinkers. I'm curious about the interactions between those two, because in my understanding, when we're looking at voices from below, what's really important to emphasize is that their locus of influence most of the time still remains the state because the state still is the most important actor 
um, both, I would say, domestically and nationally, uh, and also internationally as well. So um, I'd be curious to hear how the authors see the voices from below interacting with the state. Uh, and I'd also like to hear more about the ontological assumptions that undergird the study. So the uh, editors say that the, 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 the volume will, quote, make the study of grand strategy more rounded, better informed, and more consistent with how the world actually operates, unquote. How does the world actually operate? Um, because in my, in my opinion, the world actually operates with, you know, particularly in terms of foreign relations and particularly in terms of the American state, which elites have for the past 75 years consciously made it, I would say, anti-democratic focused uh, decision making on institutions. The world actually operates with the state making the decisions and other people um, following. So I'd be curious what the authors say about that and particularly precisely what assumptions about power and history and international relations undergird the claim about how the world actually operates. And so related to that, um, it does seem that, that, that a particular lacuna in the volume is are, are class relations and particularly the how meritocracy has functioned. Um, so it, it's interesting to note, and it might just be correlation and not causation, but the ideology of American uh, um, meritocracy took off at the exact same moment that uh, the United States became an international hegemon. Um, and you have people like Kissinger, you know, a, an exiled Jew a, a becoming secretary of state, a lot of Jews and, and um, people of color over time and women um, using the meritocratic system in order to enter the American state. So I was wondering to what degree meritocracy interacts with these um, other large state forms and how have, you know, inequality, which has increased in this country in the past 50 years, informs grand strategy. Because like many works in the field, there's kind of reference to an analogous national interest, but a national interest is not an objective thing in the world. It is defined by a series of, of people within the state. So whose national interest is being served by grand strategy? So I really like when the authors refer to plural grand strategies, but I'm again curious where their location is uh, precisely. And in fact, I would say um, the grand strategy, despite some gestures toward the opposite, is in the volume essentially defined as a strategy of the hegemon or one or two great powers, like when you're referring to the Cold War. So there's the quote, quote, grand strategy is ideological, a programmatic vision of reshaping a state's external environment and reordering to the extent that it's possible, the people who live in it, unquote. And this is why grand strategy took off in the US in the 30s and reached the peak in 1944. So there, there's a tension. So on page 13, um, the editors express some skepticism toward that position. Uh, but then I would ask them, uh, why is it that the U.S. has all the grand strategy programs and they're not in Luxembourg, right? Is it possible for Luxembourg or Belgium to genuinely have a grand strategy? I don't think they can have a grand strategy. Grand strategy is a, is a, um, is a privilege of hegemony. In a sense, it's a, it's a privilege of the uh, ability and desire to actually remake the world, which is limited, um, I would say, mostly to a few great powers throughout history, which is why, to build up what Chris was saying, the U.S. is such a good case because not many states are able to actually have grand strategy. And, and to put a, you know, a controversial, uh, to state this controversially, I would say the history grand strategy after 1945 is U.S. and at some points maybe Soviet history. And that the history of grand strategy after 1989 is mostly U.S. and maybe in the last four or five years also Chinese history. So I, I would offer I don't think grand strategy is available to everyone. And that's why to study it, you need to study the American state to some degree or the United States itself. Um, there are also just, I think, some empirical disagreements. Uh, so the authors say that Obama was, quote, not focused on grandiose initiatives um, in which the nation's aims greatly exceeded its means. Um, I would say the pivot to Asia could be understood as one such grandiose initiative. And I would say that the complete maintenance of the actual structure of the American empire, the bases, the money is itself a grandiose initiative in which, you know, the, 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 the end of controlling the world is just not possible. So the means uh, are, are just not set to fit it. Um, so I just want to note my disagreements um, there. There's also the question, the authors say that, quote, the most notorious episodes in modern history have often come as the result of badly conceived grand strategies. That's a pretty big claim. Uh, and I'd like to see them back it up uh, because that really, it's a big claim because it's essential. It's essentially a theory of history by arguing that ideas are what is driving the US action in the world. And that may be the case, but I think it needs to be uh, defended. 
And I just wanted to say that I, I love the idea of grand strategy as epistemology, as a theory of knowledge, because I think that's correct. But again, then I, uh, this begs the question of the causal force of grand strategy. And then this pro leads me to my final point, which is that I would have liked to see more analysis on the assumptions that determine US grand strategy. For example, the assumption that the US can and should dominate the world. Put, to, to, to state that a bit more clearly, I think ontology precedes epistemology. You have to have particular assumptions about the world in order to create a theory of knowledge to understand it. So it was a bit surprising to me that that ontology isn't really discussed in the, um, in the, in, in the introduction itself. Um, so again, I, I, those are just, you know, to get the conversation going. Ultimately, I think the volume is wonderful. I think it's a wonderful teaching source and will basically set the stage for this field for the coming generation. So thank you again for allowing me to read it. And thank you for giving me the time, uh, giving me the time to give my comments. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, wonderful comments and lots of questions for our uh, editors. And I don't know, Julia, you also had your hand raised. Was that on purpose or? Okay. So over to uh, Andrew and Chris um, to respond to both Julia's and, uh, and Daniel's questions. Well, Christian, when you said, when you told Danny that, you know, asked him whether we should respond to Julia's or whether Danny should just have at us. I mean, I didn't know you meant that literally. Um, Anyway, thanks to the, the, the comments from both Julia and Danny. There's just too much from both of the sets of comments. I mean, we'd be here all night if we gave them justice. I think I'll try and come, I'll try and sort of circle back to some of them uh, in, the, in the audience Q&A, um, because I think, in fact, I did notice one of the questions in the, um, in the chat that's come up or in the Q&A function already is very close to one that um, Danny asked um, about whether grand strategy is just ad hoc or whether it is actually planned or whether it is grand. So maybe we'll come back to that sort of thing. But I just want to tie a sort of one theme that popped up in the two comments, and I'll try and be as brief as possible before turning over to Chris. And that's the, the, uh, the role of the state and the role of the global. And I don't necessarily, um, and, and here we're on territory, I'm not sure if Chris is going to agree with what I'm going to say. So I'll just um, sort of go for it. But that's what, the, that's what an edited volume is for, right? It's let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, uh, and it's the role of the state and the role of the globe. And I take the, I, I take the point um, from uh, from what both Julia and Danny were saying um, about the nature of the global and the nature of the state. I, I wouldn't disagree with what you were saying, Danny, about the importance of the state. I, I myself, even in even in the 1990s, even in the early 2000s, I still think the nation state, despite what a lot of people theorized and what a lot of historians wrote, the nation state was still the primary actor in international affairs. Um, uh, but that was changing, of course, in all sorts of ways. And if you look at our 21st century world and you think about non-state actors, who a lot of times are still elites. I mean, sometimes we think of non-state actors as, as people who aren't elites, but we're still talking elites. But if we take that definition actually literally and we think of non-state actors, my, my God, I can think of an endless litany of, of, of non-state actors who are just as influential in the state on national and international affairs from large tech, you know, from big tech to big pharma to international terrorism to protest movements to um, business. We, have no, we don't have a chapter on big business um, or resource extraction, which would be great. Uh, there, we, have, we don't have chapters on lots and lots and lots of things. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that we could have a volume two, just of all the stuff we didn't look at uh, in volume one. And the things that I just mentioned of non-state actors that would clearly, I mean, to me, I think it's uh, indisputable that they would have um, you know, international finance. Uh, now, these all... Uh, rely to some extent or interact with the state at a fundamental level, of course. And then you get into, I'm not even sure if it's a chicken and the egg, but they almost become inseparable. But to say that non-state actors sort of automatically take a back seat and are therefore always subservient to the state, I think just misses the big developments of the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and, and I know you haven't, I know you haven't done that. Um, uh, so I would just, I would just flag that up. Maybe we could pay more attention to that um, in, in our volume. Uh, and I, I would fully agree with that. Um, and to link it to some, to link that to something that Julia said, I think I wrote it down properly, but she was asking, um, trying to read my handwriting here about, oh, in relation to COVID and how COVID has changed, uh, has changed our perspective. And here this got me thinking um, about state-based grant strategies. And then are, are we in a situation now, are we in a world now where we need something that transcends the state or that at least... Um, is, is multi-state or that is truly international. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reaching for a term that I can't think of on, uh, in, this, in this exact moment. 
Um, but what COVID has shown me, if, I've, if I'm thinking about grand strategy, it's the, this is really depressing actually, and it also relates to climate change, is the impossibility of a truly, of what we truly need to confront these um, global, which, glo you know, problems that I know Danny was problematizing the global, but are truly global problems, pandemics and climate change. Um, and we do have a chapter on, on pandemics, but of course, if we had another volume, we'd do much more on that. And we have nothing on climate change. And that wasn't deliberate. We, we, that was just in edited volume. Sometimes you can't cover things because of personnel issues. You wanted somebody to write a chapter on X, Y, or Z, and that person was busy or whatever. So we wanted something on climate change, but it just didn't work out. But we need a truly, I mean, we need a truly holistic, international, global, grand strategy, for, to use a term, um, to address the pandemic, but especially uh, climate change. And that just doesn't look, to me, um, it just doesn't look possible. And if somebody here would like to tell me how that is possible, that's great, because it's not going to match up with the headlines of the, on, uh, you know, on the websites and the newspapers uh, that I read, where the nation state, as Danny said, is still the primary actor. And... Um, nation states just aren't really doing, um, uh, aren't strategizing together to tackle these these truly existential problems. Thank you, Chris. I'd love to pick up where Andrew left off, which is to say um, at the intersection of Julia's question and, and Dan Danny's on the global and the current moment and the pandemic. And, you know, as someone who's done hundreds of talks in the 1918 flu pandemic, for instance, which no one was interested in and got cut out of my first book and, and a bunch of things. And, and now everyone's interested in because we're living through something remarkably similar. I would note that, you know, the question of what is the global, who feels it and where, uh, the sort of spatial reckoning of globality, um, viruses put the lie to some of that because viruses know no borders and they truly transfer between people across nation states in ways that virtually nothing else does. It hasn't. And so, you know, the many scholars have made this argument and I very much subscribe to it that the world was effectively globalized before the great war. So before 1914 and uh, the 1918, 1919 pandemic races around the globe between February, March and June. It's virtually everywhere on the planet. Very similar to, uh, you know, late fall, December, 2019, in January 2020 and um, early spring. So, you know, there's there's a global moment, whether or not you're very far from different markets or di have different technologies or broadband, uh, maybe, you know, nation, even hermit nation states like, say, North Korea uh, were affected by, by the virus. We don't, we don't know fully, right, because different nation states report differently. And you can say the same is true for the flu pandemic of 1918 and 19. You know, it was called the Spanish flu out of, you know, racist, politicized terms because the press was sent Answered in the by the British and the U.S. because of the war, so you know. In any case, um, fast forwarding lessons from that in terms of the global and uh, the way that Andrew was discussing this and Julia's question, that the U.S. out of that experience um, doesn't join the League of Nations, doesn't join the League's uh, health organization, which was explicitly trying to deal with questions of infectious disease, standardization of new treatments, um, and then coming out of the Second World War. The U.S. barely has a leadership role in the World Health Organization at that point. You know, the Betsy Bradley's chapter in our volume notes this just in passing, but it's a much more profound kind of insight than that because of the U.S.'s unilateralist impulses. There is literally no one immediately seated from the U.S. on the World Health Organization at the U.N. Um, and it takes a Soviet diplomat to get the U.S. a seat at that table. Um, so if we're thinking about lessons learned from past pandemics or glo global cataclysms like wars, you know, I think what Andrew was noting is both um, past as prologue and past as tragedy that, you know, is the world system, is the U.S. as a hegemonic power up to actually not leading per se, but being a collaborative partner in a world system where it's not so much up to nation state grand strategies, but something bigger or fundamentally different. Those two examples show how hard that is to pull off, perhaps because of parochial nationalism, you know, the way the U.S., has operated historically, some bedrock principles, I would argue, things like you know, self-sufficiency, unilateralism, non-entanglement, they, they slot into a kind of, you know, in my view, isolationist set of, 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 of core ideas that, um, that have been widely appealing to different um, American presidencies and, and, and many individuals within the nation. So that, you know, that also gets back to Julia's question, and, and maybe in our, more of our Q&A, we can get into this, you know, what sorts of aborning grand strategies do we see? 
you know, I think one thing that we see that that slightly touches on Danny's points too um, is, you know, the the Biden administration um, has been very explicitly uh, interweaving domestic and foreign. And I think all of us who are practitioners of and scholars um, who have studied and know U.S. foreign relations know how inextricably interwoven the two are, right? Uh, you know, there's always these kinds of false equivalencies, but real uh, sets of connections between the two. There's never just a war on terror and universal healthcare at home or some, some kind of bargain like that. It's always both. And there's always interest groups involved in that, as Danny was suggesting, as Andrew was underscoring. Um, so it's one of the things we're seeing about this, you know, aborning uh, foreign policy for the middle class or, or locating individuals who are, you know, uh, foreign policy thinkers in domestic circles uh, of, of the Biden administration is, a, is very much a, 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 conchi, a conscious interweaving of the two. Um, now, where that goes, you know, the jury is absolutely still out and we historians might, might be willing to wait a generation or two to figure that out. But uh, that certainly seems to be, you know, one direction there that is different. In, in terms of the question of, you know, uh, the Obama administration continuing past grand strategies, if you will, say taking a, a set of containment principles about base structures uh, and, and, and adhering to them, I guess the question there is kind of who gets to declare that uh, grand strategy, uh, one of the Obama administration versus a, versus a much more multi-administration set of foreign policies. And I think in both the more traditional literature on grand strategy and, and approach to it, and in this volume, uh, we tend to look at those continuities more and sort of just see them as longstanding and not call them out by name in the way you might be suggesting is, would be useful, Danny, or maybe are just saying, hey, at least talk about that as a kind of continuous grand strategy. Both seem fine to me, but I'm not very invested in calling that an Obama grand strategy, for instance. I don't think that that's um, particularly helpful in part because he's so he and his administration so consistently rejected that. They had a kind of ideological, anti-ideological orientation or, ideology, or pragmatism over ideology, as they put it when they were coming into office. Um, there's a lot more great comments there, but I'd love to get to the Q&A. I see the questions jumping up. Right, questions are piling up, but um, Julia, Daniel, any immediate response to, to, all right, then let's go to our first um, audience member directly, uh, Cornelia Weiss, please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, you briefly, thank you, thank briefly you very introduce much. Okay. Did you want to you say good? something? No, nope. you're good. Okay, good. Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to uh, reading the, the book. I am curious as to um, how much or how little you discuss gender and gender inequality. As you must know, uh, the highest correlation for international insecurity is gender inequality. And certainly in terms of if, if the definition of grand strategy is, um, is, 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 trying to remake the world. Uh, one example for US uh, includes General MacArthur in post-World War II occupied Japan. Um, and, and there, of course, his uh, mandate from the US was democracy and demilitarization. But he, uh, in his first meeting, he states in the achievement of the Potsdam Declaration, the traditional social order under which the Japanese people for centuries have been subjugated will be corrected. And his first demand was the emancipation of women. Now that was not uh, limited only to suffrage, it extended beyond to include what we in the US still do not have, and that is equal rights in our constitution. And then I wonder, um, why this is not taught in strategy classes, why it's not taught in military education, and the failure to do that, I would argue, extends to what we have just witnessed with regard to, Afri uh, to Afghanistan, and why when the CENTCOM commander was approached over a decade ago to for the US to plan how the US military would accomplish its promise to the women of Afghanistan that we would not abandon them, that that was expressly rejected and the US military and the US Secretary of Defense expressly 
refused to even plan for that. And if you pl fail to plan, you certainly are planning to fail. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, Chris, we'd like to take this on. And Julia and Dan, you know, feel free to chime in as well. Andrew? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Cornelia. Um, so gender is, is uh, it's a major feature in only one of the chapters, I think. Chris could correct me if I've, if I've forgotten someone. It, it does appear as a sort of more minor theme in some of the other chapters. Um, but Laura Briggs is the only one who takes it uh, head on. Um, that's not unusual for a lot of our broadened categories. I mean, we, we have, I mean, I personally would have lo would love to do a volume um, on thinking, rethinking grand strategy that has every chapter on religion, but we just have one chapter on religion. That chapter does touch on, on women and gender. Um, but again, just as a kind of minor theme, but Laura Briggs is the only chapter that takes it on, that, that really takes it on fully. That's also true, not just of religion, but of race, of immigration. Um, there is some a little bit of intersectionality, if you will, um, between categories like that. Um, but I take the point uh, about the importance of gender and especially the importance of gender and the role of women um, in development, in strategy, in grant strategy, in American foreign policy, um, and how it's, um, uh, it's extremely co complicated. Um, and it complicates grant strategy in ways that we would like to welcome, but also that, that maybe we wouldn't welcome so much. Um, I think it's a fairly... Uh, recent phenomenon. Um, and uh, when we look at sort of the emergence of globalization and neoliberalism and the role of the sort of promotion of women's rights through the 90s into the 2000s that then dovetailed with liberal interventionism, that's a really interesting story that some scholars have started to tell. But I think it, there's a huge amount of room to investigate that further, uh, the extent to which those were genuine goals, the extent to which those were um, sort of pretexts for uh, interventionism uh, especially in, in the, the greater Middle East and so on and so forth. So all that's to say, thanks for the question. And um, uh, it, it's hugely important um, and it's in the volume, but not as much as perhaps uh, it should be. Great, thank you. Chris, Love briefly. To dig in on that. Yeah, just to, to give an example. So in, in, in the Briggs chapter, you know, um, the, the key there is how birth control, among other things, how birth control as a kind of technological fix for overpopulation became embedded in national security policies. And, and there's a great example in there of, of Henry Kissinger actually writing about this, advocating for birth control as part of containment. And so, you know, part of this rethinking that we're doing in the book um, is exposing how if you take a reproductive lens for on a reproductive um, uh, politics lens, a, a gender and sexuality lens on grand strategy, you could find it even uh, in the works, in the efforts of sort of archetypal grand strategists like Kissinger, for instance. And in my own chapter, I would just add, you know, I, I talk about um, Du Bois and Woodrow Wilson, but for me, a major player is in the aborning internationalism of the 1910s and 1920s is the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And so Jane Addams and Emily Balch play a big role in there for me, the first two American women to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And that is also underscoring something that Danny brought up, um, the, the role of uh, international non-governmental organizations and how much power they can have. You know, I think the effort of the 1928 kellogg Brand Pact to outlaw war coming from largely out of the multinational efforts of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, though, of course, it's ineffectual in the end, and we know how that history plays out, um, you do a real disservice to those historical actors and their sweeping goals and successful strategies uh, when, you, when, you, when you play it out in that way and dismiss their efforts, when in reality, you know, the international outlawry of war movement was one of the most important and significant in the 1920s and 1930s, and it was largely led by women. Thank you. Let's go to David Rabinovitz. David. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, with the current uh, political situation in the U.S., where uh, if going back at least 50 years, where government direction can change 180 degrees every four or eight years, is it even meaningful to speak of American strategy, much less grand strategy? would like to take that up. I'll take a quick stab at it. I'm curious to know what, what our fellow panelists also have to say about that. But so if you're thinking, um, uh, well, I'll shift the terms of the question in a typical professorial way. It strikes me that one thing that the Trump administration has shown is that there was an assumption embedded 
in many of our analyses of U.S. foreign policy that there would be continuity across administrations. Now, you may argue that there was more continuity there than some of us realize or those who were shocked with the election of Donald Trump. But, you know, you can't deny the fact that that pledges made, such as the Iran nuclear deal, the uh, Paris Peace Accord, the rise of a Trans-Pacific Partnership, the pledges made by previous administrations, work done over time, were, were rapidly overturned. And the kinds of rhetorical strategies of U.S. foreign policy were also overturned by that presidency. So I think this to, to um, put it more succinctly, the Trump administration proved to uh, allies and adversaries around the world alike that they couldn't necessarily count on continuity across administrations. So if you're arguing, if the core of your question is, hey, American foreign policy can pivot every four years, I would suggest, you know, the track record for that isn't so great. Uh, you could argue that there's a lot more continuity than discontinuity. But the more recent past suggests perhaps that that was uh, just happenstance uh, and that, that there is more room for uh, abrupt changes uh, of, to, to strategy. Daniel? I'd like to register a polite, polite disagreement. I would say that Trump, in fact, showed the sheer continuities of the, of the, the grand strategy since 45 which is world leadership slash hegemony slash empire. And despite pulling out of um, the JCPOA and the TPP and instituting some tariffs, the, again, the structure, the forest remained relatively the same. You know, no base closures, uh, defense spending goes up, more use of drones, the institutionalization of the Obama counterterrorism project, which Biden, despite pulling out of Afghanistan, just promised to continue in perpetuity. Um, so I think it does depend where you look and what you're emphasizing and for what purposes. Um, and I think that's really interesting. That's what I was trying to get at with my with my comment about plural grand strategies. So, and that's again, what I was trying to get at with my, my question or my comment about ontology. Because I think Trump for all his bluster shared the fundamental assumption of everyone since let's say Truman, if not FDR, which is that the US needs to dominate the world through armed economic uh, through armed military supremacy and economic leadership hegemony through dollar supremacy. And that has remained incredibly stable, even if at the margins you have slight shifts in policy. Thank you. I'd like to call on John Pradas next. John Pradas. John. Okay, let me get on the phone here. We are... You're good? Yep. You're good? Yeah. Okay. okay. I appreciate very much. Um, uh, Danny's commentary about uh, the ontology and epistemology of grand strategy. This is a subject that I've been looking at for a very long time. Um, and I also disagree with the idea that only a state or a nation state could have a grand strategy. Grand strategies can be widely distributed among states non-state actors, uh, businesses like uh, Matthew was talking about, um, whomever you like. But uh, what I'm missing here is hearing something about what is the content of a grand strategy? That is, what elements, when you're looking at something and, and identifying it as a grand strategy, what elements should you expect to see forming part of that, okay? Thank you, John. Uh, th should I, Christian, should I yeah, answer? Please go ahead. Okay, please, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's a great question. I think there isn't really, thanks for the question, John. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to hear from you. Um, uh, I mean, the content of a grand strategy, it depends on what the grand strategy is. And I, I started thinking that with, with Danny's comment um, and his really interesting point about this, con this line of continuity from FDR or Trump um, up to up to Biden, because of you know if if the objective is to pursue um, global hegemony or global dominance in perpetuity, um, then yeah, there is a lot of continuity there. But that's not the strategy. The, that's not the grand strategy. Um, that's the objective. That's what the grand strategy is meant to attain. And then if that's the ultimate goal, then there are all sorts of ways of pursuing that ultimate goal. Um, uh, that's why I still think one of the best um, studies of America's Cold War is John Gaddis's strategies of containment, strategies in the plural. 
the, the, the goal was always the same for Cold War presidents, but they pursued that goal in very different ways. They had very different um, grand strategies, but uh, the ultimate goal was the same. And so what would the content of a grand strategy be? It would depend on what the objective is. It really would. Um, and it would depend on who is then implementing, who's devising the strategy, and then who's implementing that strategy. And one of the points that we try, one of the most important points that we try and make from the book is that normally when people are asked, well, what is the content of a grand strategy? It's diplomatic, um, sort of macroeconomic, um, and, and especially military. And what we're saying is, yes, of course, that is extremely important, as Danny's implying, or as he implied in his comments, maybe that's still the most important aspect of a grand strategy. But it's not just that. There are other things. And I think the last 20 years, the last 10 years, the last two weeks or four weeks or whatever, have really, I would say, borne that out. Thank you. Um, David Kanan, if you could pose your question. Yes, do, we, do, you, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for the, uh, the conversation and Danny's comments and John Prados' question really help, I think, concret concretize what struck me. I've read the book, but struck me as being a rather general, uh, generalized level of conversation. It's hard for me to get a hold of it until those comments came in. A question on the context of grand strategy along the lines of the issues of, again, ontology before epistemology. To what extent does the change in the nature of how we communicate um, affect the ability to construct and implement grand strategies? For example, from, in other words, from the change from um, uh, periods of time when you could not pass information very quickly and to very many people, to the mechanical electronic era after the, after the uh, um, after the telegraph and then the telephone, and now to, to a period of time in, in, in when we now can pass enormous amounts of information very broadly, very deeply, where whether or not states remain the actors, they certainly don't have a monopoly over kinds of information they used to have monopolies over at least for a time. And where even currency, um, you know, you know the, the currency used to be one of the basic basic points of sovereignty, right? You coined, you coined the currency, you controlled money and you could, um, and you could control its, its, its baseness or, or richness and, and its amount to a certain extent. Now it's, now it's being transferred electronically. To what extent does the, just the, the depth and breadth of the availability of information, the way it is passed through so many different means and to so many people in so many different ways affect the ability of traditional political actors to craft grand strategies that they can sort of uh, gel, that don't that that sort of don't slip between their fingers as things happen around them. Um, does this matter? Does, does the question of information uh, and who has it, how it's passed, how many people get what information matter in the ability to construct and implement a grand strategy? Thank you, Andrew, Chris. I'm happy to add a little to this. I'm also curious what Julia would say about operationalizing humanitarian relief and foreign assistance as, a, as an example of information. I'm thinking of the CNN effect in the 90s and how humanitarian communications literature tried to figure out how changing the information landscape altered how publics and policymakers thought about humanitarianism. Um, but I'll tackle some intersection of that as fast as I uh, of the other pieces of the question um, and the last two really. Um, so I'm the, uh, I've been puzzling over the epistemology question for quite a while. Um, and, you know, from, from my perspective and just to help again, to concretize, you know, one of the things we talk about in the book and we, and we draw from, um, the scholar Nina Silov is that there's grand plans, grand principles, grand behavior. These are three types that have value, um, but that they, they don't have to be seen in opposition. Um, and if you think about, if you approach grand strategy as epistemology, and I'm pretty, pretty wedded and convinced that that's the best way to understand it. It's a, as a theory of knowledge of international history that organizes outcomes and methods, means and desired ends. Um, one thing that that illuminates for me studying the actual historical archival record is so many of these policymakers, so many of these INGOs, so many of these other actors that we see are invoking the lessons of history, actual interpretations of history, organizing their historical knowledge of history to then leverage that knowledge to make arguments for how, uh, how their desired ends can be achieved by particular means. And that's a really fascinating turn. You see this in the, in the 20s, for instance, and in thinking about what got the world into World War I one and then how to prevent another cataclysm or to reshape the world order. Um, and 
and you see that in other eras too. You see that very much in the '90s. We could all, everybody on this panel could spend the whole rest of the time talking about how historicist understandings and battles over historical inter- interpretation since the end of the Cold War have really animated different proposed means ends relationships uh, in international relations. Um, so that's that's one piece of it. Another concretization that I think is useful that we didn't get to is to go back to Clausewitz. And the, so the, his famous, uh, just to paraphrase, his famous way of understanding this. He never talked about grand strategy. Was the tactics of the use of armed forces, in particular battles, while strategy is really about the doctrine of the use of individual battles to win a war. And then most grand strategists after that period, most people working on this talk about um, how to shape the peace. And so what we're doing more capaciously is to look about look at the broader dimensions of that, that plans aren't grand strategies. Plans are intended to execute their mechanisms for it, or to paraphrase Eisenhower, right? It's about the planning and not about the plans. Um, Julia. Yeah, no, I, and I don't want to take too much time away from, and I see there's more hands and more questions in the box too, but I think this question of media is an important one, right? And we can look, if you pose the question of humanitarian assistance, but we can look back to the 19th century and the rise of photography, right? As a lot of scholars have argued, promoting the idea for some of the first, what we would identify as humanitarian interventions in the first place and humanitarian aid being part of nation's grand strategies and foreign policies. And certainly that changes over the course of the 20th century with the you know, rise of, of wireless communications and, and um, the telegraph and everything like that too. And then you pointed to the CNN effect, but there's this much longer history uh, of the ways that media uh, shapes what people think is important and how they come to know um, about distant suffering, about what might be defined as the interest uh, of a nation state. So I'll just kind of leave it at there, but I, I agree there's, there's a lot to come back there. Great, see. Well, let's see if we can get a couple more questions. And Steve Lipson, uh, you're up next. Please unmute yourself. Uh, hi. Uh, uh oh. Uh, I wanted to give Professor Preston a chance to talk more about religion, and your your chapter example looked at. 19th century missionaries. Uh, and when we think of uh, religion and grand strategy today, we might think of countries like Saudi Arabia that have a distinct uh, theological uh, framework. Uh, but the United States uh, uh, doesn't have a, uh, doesn't say it has a, a specific religious aspect to it. So I wonder what, grand, what religious grand strategy looks like for the United States as a state and how, if at all, that has changed over time. Thank you. Wait a um, minute, Andrew. Okay, super brief. Uh, actually, that's an easy question to answer um, because I didn't write the chapter on 19th century missionaries in this in this volume. I wrote a chapter on Edward Mead Earl and national security and grand strategy in the 1930s and 1940s and thinking about those two concepts. I have, however, written a, a book on exactly what you, <laughs> exactly your question called Sword of the Spirit. And um, uh, I, I would refer you to that and then maybe we can follow it up after, but I'll keep it at that. Great. Uh, let's go to Richard Maas. If you could please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, and thanks uh, to the editors and, and to the panelists for a great panel. And uh, it really is a good book. I'm going to be talking about it with my grad students this week and looking forward to that. Um, I'd like to um, push the editors a little bit on the notion of um, non-state actors and state actors in, in grand strategy. Um, pre this volume, most people who talk about American grand strategy would be talking about the National Security Council, the White House, right, where the strategizing is being done. Um, that would represent American grand strategy. Um, and I'm curious how uh, the editors coming out of the process of making the volume see the role of non-state actors. Um, can non-state actors do grand strategy? Uh, or, or if they can do grand strategy, does that count as American grand strategy if it's outside of the government? Um, or is their role more shaping American grand strategy? Or perhaps it's offering alternatives that later US leaders might pick up as grand strategy in a political economy sort of sense, representing racial groups or economic groups or whatnot. Um, but curious to hear the thoughts on that. Can I speak to this first? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think one of the ones ways to think about this is the ways that this divide feels 
it, it's, it's a fake divide, right? So non-state actors, what we call non-state actors, are often receiving benefits from the government in terms of subsidies, in terms of recognition, in terms of being chartered. Uh, they're influencing the government through lobbying, through uh, donations, political action campaigns. You know, so uh, there are a number of organizations which are what um, historian uh, Emily Rosenberg once called chosen instruments of the United States government that we think of in non-governmental or organizations, but in fact, are intimately wedded to the government. Um, the American Red Cross, which is what I study, had its original um, headquarters in the office of the War and Navy and State Departments um, until it got its own headquarters, um, which is right down the street. So it was easy to get, to get in touch with the State Department at any time. Uh, so I think we need to look beyond this kind of artificial divide between non-state and state actors and recognize that they're really linked in ways that we don't often acknowledge. And can I just briefly add to that? I think that's an exact, exactly correct. And particularly the American state at the moment of, moment of its hegemony constructed a very peculiar state that is made up of an incredible amount of private actors that perform properly state functions. I mean, I study think tanks, which very quickly uh, serve as the research arm of the American state. So I think um, probably the next generation of scholarship could complicate that state non-state divide in a meaningful way and be precise about which powers were given to whom, when, and why, as opposed to the, you know, now we're focusing on non-state actors and now we're focusing on state actors. I think that's a very, um, you know, um, potentially generative research agenda that the volume itself speaks to. Absolutely, and it's a tradition that goes back, um, you know, before World War II, before the Cold War. That's Tocqueville, that's voluntarism. That's also going back to the founding and a decentralized uh, state, separation of powers, checks and balances, um, federalism. I mean, that that's sort of baked into the American system. And then at the moment of American hegemony, as you say, Danny, it's it's sort of it's not created then, but it becomes a kind of it becomes a strength, as you, it, it, as it were, of a certain type of American power that isn't unique, but is pretty different from major global, you know, globe spanning powers. And Richard, thank you for your question. And, you know, I think that one of the surprising findings of gathering the scholars involved, as Julia noted at the outset of her comments, was how many different groups were involved in formal and informal policymaking that could be understood as grand strategy. So one of the taglines we have for the book, but that I think is really important, and I encourage, I'd be curious to know what your graduate students think about this, is that there are lots of hidden strategists and strategies in the historical record. Um, and that's something we found particularly located in this, you know, as Danny was suggesting, kind of artificial, or, or, or as Julia put it, like a false binary between non state and state actors, right? And that, that the subtle influences as well of those peoples and groups um, are also worth understanding in terms of this concept of strategic culture. So, you know, um, we're, we're, we're pretty invested. The book shows a whole lot of different ways in which uh, so-called non-state actors affect the state um, and are attempting to affect the state, even if they don't get the outcomes that they want. Um, and then, of course, you know, the other piece of this would be if we could write this book differently, if this weren't U.S. focused, you could do, you could think about all the groups that have had quarters and, uh, and, and chapters in other countries, right? The Red Cross may start in the US, but it winds up being all over the world with different kinds of, right? It doesn't actually start. All right. Right. Uh, I've read, um, you know, but the Red Crescent and the ways in which these kinds of um, state structures uh, and non-state structures and chosen instruments blur in an international community setting. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm afraid uh, with apologies to the many folks we couldn't get to, including those who posted their uh, questions, but I, uh, I know the, uh, our panelists have, have looked at them. So with apologies for those of you we couldn't get to, with thanks to Andrew, Christopher, Julia, and Daniel. I'm now turning this over to Eric for concluding remarks. What a great session this was. Thanks, we're off to a fantastic start for this Washington History Seminar. Eric. Thanks, Christian, and thank you to our panelists and to our audience members. We invite you to join us next week on Monday, September 20th at 4 p.m. when we return to discuss Mia Bay's recent book, Traveling Black, a story of race and resistance with the author and Greta Jong and Sage Matthew. And with that, good night and take care. <laughs>